house painting and uh, really cool techniques. And so that's part of a new program that we're starting actually this fall called the Metro Maker Series. So we'll make sure that you know about that. Um, so welcome. welcome, and one of my requests to you um, is that when you leave here tonight as you're talking about your experiences that you help us let people know about this space. It's an unusual spot, no doubt. Some things that she'd like to say about her work in general, and it's also open to questions during her talk as well. Take away. I recognize everyone here. <laughs> um, it is so nice. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, Amy, I've known Amy but since the late 80s. Yeah. Um, from the Metropolitan School for the Arts. Some of you remember the uh, school on Montgomery Street that was a wonderful school. It had dance, it had music, it had so many different things. And uh, Marta Bell was a teacher there. Right? Amy was a teacher there. I was a teacher there. Um, and it had a good run. I remember it was Annetta Kaplan that started it. And that's how things start. They start out small and they grow and they grow and they grow. And then people talk to people and the arts are usually communicated through people that know people. And it keeps going that way. So I was thrilled when Amy offered me to do this show. And I worked hard on it. Uh, even though my studio was 104 degrees one day, <laughs> and better, I mean, there is one hot warehouse, um, and it didn't matter. I mean, I, I took a fan and I put spray, I just kept spraying myself with water. I was working in my bra and panties, I have to tell you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Really? I, Which I, panties? I, <laughs> Painting. He started out as a glass, uh, someone who painted on glass, very folk art. But his works did represent realistic uh, scenes. But as he walked down towards his piece, he had an aha moment. He looked at it and he goes, oh, I really like what I see, but I don't know what I'm seeing. And what he was seeing was a little bit of abstraction going on. That's when abstraction began for him. He saw his painting on the side, but because he maybe he had a few drinks, who knows, he went out to dinner. <laughs> but when he looked at the piece,
piece he saw abstract, and he was taken by it, and he was wowed by it, and he began to develop it. And then he realized, oh, this is a language. This is a way to communicate. This is something that can involve music, it involves story, it can involve so many wonderful things. So when I do an abstract, especially that has some symbolism in it that is somewhat realistic, like a moon, blue moon, a building, color shapes, windows. My influence was Kandinsky. The other thing that he did was he was very, very hot color. He loved color. And we went to, uh, was it Munich? We were in Munich. We went mm -hmm. to um, the main museum of art there, uh, the Stag Stagels, I think it was. It was part of the Blue Rider School. I'm sorry, I should have made some little notes on my arm. <laughs> Um, but it was part of the Blue Rider School, which he started, and all of his gigantic, colorful paintings were hanging in this incredible uh, space. It was just an architectural wonder. And I, w I was what, in my 40s, I think. I was in my 40s. I was like a school kid. I was in there walking from one painting to another, and I was blown away. It was all abstract. How could this be? How could he be here? And I'm in the United States. I want to be here. And that's how I learned about Kandinsky firsthand. I started looking at his work for real and realizing he truly was an artist I wanted to follow. Another artist was Paul Clay. Paul Clay was also a mus musician. And he played the uh, violin. I believe he also played the viola. And he was part of the... Um, Blue Rider School as well. And this was uh, late 1800s, I believe early 1900s. And Paul Clay told stories with his art. He told stories about things that were happening, but he used symbolism not much different than what Native Americans use. Like a tree symbol would be a line with lines coming out like this. That was a tree. A cat would be a round head with big eyes, whiskers. And he would put these into some very colorful backgrounds <coughs> and create little stories in his paintings. But it was very abstract as well. So he was taking what was important from something and making it into something. And that impressed me as well. He also wrote a, 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 one of his books he wrote with me, pedagogical uh, sketchbook. And this was all about how to use pedagogy when you're when you're writing and learning about art. Uh, symbolism of all types came into his uh, process. The other artist, believe it or not, that has influenced me is Andy Warhol. Why Andy Warhol? You know, he's a very commercial artist, but Andy Warhol liked to repeat himself, and he liked to get attention. So if you, you notice, you walk around, you look at these pieces, you'll see repetitiveness, things that are happening over and over again but in different ways. To me, that's a way of communicating what interests me. I like passages, I like music, I like color, and I like it when it repeats in a rhythmic way. So it's creating a rhythm that you want to follow and you want to get into. And Andy Warhol also was quite a character, and I loved, loved, loved reading his biography. He, um, he was crazy. <laughs> and he did some wonderful art in many different ways. And But he was, he had a rough childhood. He had a, a very sickly childhood. And when he got older, he used his inability to do certain other things where he was moving around and, and being more athletic or whatever to develop his art. So I think that in that regard, I respected what he did with what he had. And of course, he, he's famous. He's dead, but he's famous. Um, the other artist, I think, I think that's enough for, for influences. What? Because I have a lot of influence. Some of the artists that are living today um, influence me. Uh, and you know, I'm always looking at other artists. I'm always respecting what they do, and I'm curious. I've never lost my curious curiosity. I'm 67 years old. I will continue to be curious to the day I die. You need to keep that interest and that excitement going. And when you meet a young artist and you say, oh, wow.
What do you do? Be interested. Like to see what they're doing. Look at their work because that can influence you in amazing ways. Next question. Okay. <laughs> She's up. Um, so you just mentioned being curious, and this isn't on your sheet, so I'm off script. But um, you introduced acoustics into your world. Mm -hmm. um, and out of curiosity, no doubt. Curiosity. And how it has working in a new media shifted your thinking or your approach or your work? Well, that goes back to Paul Clay again. Paul Clay was very experimental. He tried things that no other artist tried, and he didn't care. He just wanted to do things. He wanted to experiment and try different ways of putting work out there. Uh, and when I discovered acoustic, I liked the idea that you could use real tools, a blowtorch, not a big one, a little one. If Arlene and Ben were here, she'd say, ah, oh, that's nothing. But I started out with a little cooking torch, torch that you can put onto a can, and you order these cans, and you can attach it and use up the gas in it. But I also use a heat gun, and I also use a lot of uh, sharp tools. And if you look at this piece down here, someone earlier was one of the students, so, or arts, young arts. Your name again? Erin. Erin. Erin was asking me how I got the indentations, what I did. First of all, this is beeswax. It's 100% beeswax. I don't use any chemicals. It's pure. The only chemical you'll find is if I use oil paint to develop the colors. And I, I pretty much drain all the chemicals out of the oil so that it will mix well with the, the hot wax. And this particular piece I used Collage, I used monoprint using encaustic, uh, which was uh, colored uh, wax on, that I developed onto a plate that I would heat up, and the plate's flat, and I would paint onto the, pit, onto the heated plate with the encaustic, and then I would take a piece of paper right over the top of it, and I would, not with my hands, because it burns, it's hot. I would use a, um, what is that thing, the baron, a baron to rub it to pick up the wax and make a print. So I'd pull that off, and then I would in introduce that into the background of the piece. Then I would apply more wax, and I would say on this particular piece, there's probably about oh, seven or eight applications of wax with a gesso underneath so that it doesn't soak into the wood too much, because as you work, um, encaustic will sink in. And what's interesting about encaustic is that it becomes almost glass-like. And that fascinates me, and one of the reasons I, I got involved with it is my grandfather, who was from Wales, and I found the city where he was born, Fran, Swansea, Wales. And uh, he was a laborer. He was a glass blower, but he was a laborer. So I always had these Fantasies. Oh my God! My grandfather was a, a class boy. <laughs> Lucky I am. You know. Then I get over there and I went to see the person uh, in Tembe, in Wales, and I, who took care of the records, the public records of uh, family names. And I said, my grandfather's name was Warren, William Warren, and he was a glass boy. And she goes, Oh, she goes, Oh my dear, I'm sorry to tell you, but he was just a laborer. I go, Oh. <laughs> you know, so it was no big deal. But it was a big deal to me as a kid, because I always thought, my grandfather was a glass boy. You know, you think about all the beautiful glass you see, like in Corning, New York, and some of the museums. And, you know, it wasn't that kind of glass. It was utilitarian. Um, so but anyway, encaustic reminds me some a little bit of glass. Uh, urban B, two questions. What shapes or textures stand out for you about the urban landscape, and what music do you use as your references or your influences? Okay, the, the thing that stands out to me the most are the bridges. Um, where you walk through the city of Syracuse, especially through the um, neighborhoods around here, um, over off Hiawatha Boulevard, over near, um, well, I want to say, uh, Elevated Center. There's a bridge area right there, and if you look carefully when you drive by, you'll see people that are actually living in the abutments and 
Woods over on Hiawatha and uh, 690 exit. When you get off, if you look to the when you get off, if you look to the left, you'll see a gentleman sitting there in his chair, usually a lawn chair. But if you look up, way up underneath, every bit of his belongings are stuck up in the abutment. And he that's his whole life. That's where he lives. So I take those shapes that I see of the bridges, and I take the colors that I see from seeing their belongings. Like this particular gentleman loves color, and a lot of his things are very colorful. It's kind of neat looking up there, seeing all this stuff stuck up there. That it's his entire world. But when I paint, I see those things. I see what some people would consider ugly, and I consider it beautiful. Because here's someone who's trying to survive in our crummy world that has been crummy for him, but he's trying to survive. He's trying to make himself important in his own way. Here I am, I live under a bridge, but here I am. And these are my colors, and these are my shapes. So that comes into my abstract painting, and that brings me to one of my questions that I put down that she might ask me. Um, why do I like to paint abstract from reality? Because real, to me, sometimes is more painful and, and can be hard to translate, especially um, our world is so difficult. And, and it's hard to look at all the ugly that's in the world. So when you paint it into the abstract, it suddenly becomes beautiful. It becomes something else. It becomes desirable. It becomes a part of everybody's experience. We, we are all part of each other, no matter what Trump says. And we will continue to be a part of each other. And colors and music, and where the music comes in, I, I often listen to classical music. I love jazz as well. But to me, that's the rhythm of the city. There's a beat. There's a heartbeat. And it's, it's, it's structure. It's architecture. It's people. It's experience. It's life. It's watching a guy outside of Delavan digging through the cigarette butts, trying to find a cigarette that he can smoke. Um, throwing a whole half a sandwich in the trash there, knowing he's going to pick it up and eat it. You know, that is the human experience. And that's how I interpret it. Um, what's the role of photo photography for you in your references or your searching or your inspiration? I go around and I, I take pictures of my cell phone of some of the uh, urban areas that are, that are trying to renew, um, especially around Franklin Square area, down towards the uh, waterfront area. They've torn down a lot of buildings and they're redoing them, refurbishing, remaking them, trying to make them more livable, uh, more desirable. What's fascinating is when you look at these buildings, when they've ripped off a wall, there's one that is on, what is the name of that street? If you go on West Street and you get you, that exit there, when you go back towards, uh, I can never think of the name of it. Plum Street? Yes, Plum Street. There is a building there where they ripped off the whole part of it, but underneath there are all these signs from like 1800s or something. And you're going, oh my God, there's another life there. There's a whole another yeah. century there. So when I see that, I have to take a picture. And I only do that to stimulate my visual senses. I never copy a picture, because why should I? I mean, it's abstract. There's no sense in it. But I get some of my stimulation by taking photographs. I was going to have some of them to show here, but I never got to that. Um, what do you see when you look between the cracks? Oh, well, that goes back to the bridges and to the, to the hidden areas in, in, in our city. But especially if you walk down the street in our city, when you're walking along some of the torn up sidewalks and some of the areas that have been uh, beaten up by weather, time, whatever, you'll see things that maybe are just 
shapes, broken edges, um, human waste, whatever, it's there. And for me, it, again, it, I'm seeing things that somebody else may not see, just because I'm looking. I'm looking for it. I'm looking over there. I'm looking down there. I'm not just daydreaming and walking over. I don't advise that anyone who's sitting in Syracuse don't daydream and walk. Keep, keep your eyes open. But yeah, if you look in the crowd, so if you walk behind, for example, the um, armory there in Armory Square, and you go over where the uh, under, where the opening is, where the railroad station comes over, I think it used to be a railroad station. You walk along that wall, that's an ancient wall. That's been there forever. Great cracks in that wall. Mm -hmm. And if I were a young artist, I'd be out there with big pieces of paper and doing rubbings because the cracks are amazing. And what happens when you when you get into that kind of repetitiveness of making something over and over again is that you start to see things that you may not have seen otherwise. I think that's what I see in cracks anyway. Um, everybody has a way that they begin work. Some people start with a blank canvas. Well, lately I've been just uh, putting a lot of color on the canvas uh, and then going back in and drawing and then rubbing it out and then drawing and then rubbing it out and then putting more color in. And the reason I do that is because it's much like the worn out environment that we have around us, the old uh, buildings. Uh, you get more character and more texture that way from a surface. So keep building up and keep going back into it, things happen and you, go, you have an aha moment, oh look, this is starting to come through. Uh, like, for example, Psychopath. Psychopath is about, not a psychopath that kills people, but it's about the bicycle path that goes from uh, Armory, from over by um, Franklin Square, all the way down to the waterfront. And I've ridden it a few times, but I've had time and it's not been 100 degrees out. But when you go along the cycle path, bicycle path, you get a, a sense and a feeling of a lot of movement, especially when you're riding pretty fast. And I like to ride fast. I like to go down from Dallas. So it's a nice path. It's very fun. But the best part of the experiencing that kind of movement and that kind of imagery is that it goes by very quickly and then all of a sudden it comes back to you so not so much this piece, a little bit more over in this piece. If you, yeah. Has anybody here done the psychopath? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, at one end of it is where they have the con they had, they did they were having concerts for a while. So they had this tent, and I think that's over um, just before yeah. the mall. Yeah. yeah. So there's the tent. And, and then you're riding along and you see maybe the uh, canal the coming through, the water coming through. And then you're riding along and then you see another bicyclist and you see the wheel and you see things coming through the wheel and you see paths and you see more water and the waterfront and then the buildings. So it all comes together in a very... Uh, That's true. <laughs> Abstract way, with a lot of movement, a lot of rhythm and a lot of movement. So did that answer the question? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> it answered your question. But I, um, I do have a question, though. Is there some aspect of your career or moment of your career that you perhaps are the most proud of or that resonates for you as you stand here at 67 doing this work? Because I don't feel like I've had a career, I think I feel like I've had a life. And you know, being an artist is not a career. It really isn't. And and you can't really teach people to be an artist. You can teach people how to make things, how to how to do a painting, how to do a drawing, how to use the materials. But a career is something where you're making you're getting a paycheck. And you're punching a clock sometimes. And I haven't had a career, I've had a life as an artist, and it's so different. And I haven't had any really special time that made it 
more wonderful or worse than it's been. I think the hardest time for me, if you want to speak about hard times, when I got sick in 98, when I got cancer, I couldn't work. And I felt abandoned by my own talent. I felt like it wasn't going to come back because I was feeling like maybe this is what made me sick. And I'm really not sure what made me sick. Something made me sick. It was, it was a very unusual form of uh, throat cancer. And I wasn't smoking. I had smoked up until the time I was 34, but I quit. I got the cancer when I was 49. And it was four-stage throat cancer. And it will kill you, and it's killed a few people that I know. And uh, I just, I thought that that was the lowest part. But the highest part, I like to think I haven't hit it yet. <laughs> yeah, I like to think I'm going to go with Marta Bell to New York. I'm going to get a New York show. That's what I think, you know? And, and it's okay. It's good to dream. And I want to keep dreaming and making my art. And, and I love it. Oh, this is so special, having 